Welcome, welcome. Wow, it sounds good in here. Can we just all take a moment to appreciate how fabulous this room is, this building, this ambiance? It is absolutely amazing to be here with you all. I'm Marcy Harris. I am executive director of the Popbox Foundation and on behalf of an amazing team, I'm so happy to be here with you and to welcome you to what I think is gonna be a very special conversation between two dear friends about modernizing government from a bipartisan perspective. Our mission at Popbox Foundation is to inform and empower people and make government work better for everyone. And these two have been working on that for a very long time. In preparing for tonight, I decided to go back and find an email that I sent to Jen when I'd heard that she had been uh, selected to be President Obama's Deputy Chief Technology Officer. By that time, she'd been running Code for America for about four years, building a community of civic technologists and placing fellows all around city governments and making the case for civic technology. May 17th. 2013. I know that you know it's not going to be easy. In fact, the second thing I thought after that's so amazing is, poor Jen, this is going to be so frustrating. <laughs> and you know that big change starts with small victories, that telling the story and winning converts starts with potholes and fire hydrants. You already know that, and you've already done that so well. I'm not just excited about what happens in the next year, but what comes after. After you scale whatever mountains are ahead and fight whatever battles loom, the perspective and authority that you will take back out into the world will be amazing. There's so much work to do, and you are one of the people who so steadily, lovingly, modestly, responsibly is leading the way. After this experience, your voice will be even stronger, and I'm so excited for what that will mean. Which is basically to say, I wanted Jen to write a book. <laughs> and she finally did. Uh, and I'm so grateful that she has chosen to start her journey. This book is not even out yet, folks. You get to hear about it tonight. It comes out next week. It is, and I quote, one of the best policy books I've ever read says Ezra Klein of the New York Times in his post today entitled, The Book I Wish Every Policymaker Would Read. So with that, I have nothing more to say except welcome Jen Palka and thank you for being here with us. You know, people ought to warn you if they're gonna make you cry right before you get up. <laughs> thank you, Marcy. I, uh, when I was writing this book, I never pictured reading from it in the Library of Congress. Uh, and when you asked me to come do that, I thought, that can't be real. <laughs> but you're a goddess, and you make the best things happen. Thank you for all that you've done for me for over 10 years. Let's not talk about even how far beyond that was. And thank you, Victoria, and the rest of the Pop Fox staff. You've done such a fantastic job. Um, before I read, I just have to tell you guys, my husband's here and it's his birthday. So if you want to know the secret to a happy marriage, find a partner who when you say, uh, the event might be on your birthday, says, there's no better place to spend my birthday than the Library of Congress. <laughs> um, and my sister and her husband drove up from Virginia. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, there's just two other people I want to call out. Uh, chapter five and chapter four are here. <laughs> Mike Byrne and his lovely son, Will, chapter five. And where's MTAV back there? Uh, you will hear about the Dominic story, not necessarily tonight. Um, that's her amazing work, so. Um, I'm gonna read you a passage from the book, but I have to set it up a little bit. Um, this comes after a really lengthy explanation of a challenge that a friend of ours, Matthew Weaver, found himself in. He had been sent to help uh, cl clear a, a sort of a jam at the, at the Air Force. They were trying to update the software on the satellites that 
enable GPS. So this is a pretty important project. And the team that he'd been sent to help at Raytheon was stuck because they'd been required by the RFP in the project to use something called an enterprise service bus. You do not need to know what that is, except to know that it didn't belong there. And it was making the transmission of the data from the satellites to the ground not work. And they could not take it out. And he went back and sort of figured out where that requirement had come from and traced it all the way back to essentially, uh, you know, not exactly in the law, as you'll hear, but from something that Congress had written. And so uh, Weaver's detective story here ends, and this is where we start. A little in the way there. It's true that many laws and policies fail because they are overly prescriptive and lock implementers into a narrow set of options. But that is not quite what happened here. In fact, neither the Klinger-Cohen Act nor any other federal law explicitly required an ESB. Raise your hand if you know what the Klinger-Cohen Act is. <laughs> Couple people. Nowhere in the federal enterprise architecture does it say, thou shall always use an enterprise service bus. There are five mentions of enterprise service bus in the document, but all of them are in charts or diagrams listing various application components that could support interoperability. ESVs became mandatory in practice within the Department of Defense through overzealous interpretations of law, policy, and guidance combined with a lack of technical understanding. How does this happen? When there are big visible delivery failures like healthcare.gov, public servants are trapped between two distinct systems of accountability. In the first, politicians will hold the public servants accountable for outcomes whether the website works to enroll people, or whether benefits are actually getting to claimants. In this system, there will be hearings. Congressional committees held 10 separate hearings on healthcare.gov in a single month in 2013, all as the people being called to testify were otherwise working night and day to get the site back up. Angry politicians will summon bureaucrats to the Hill, or the state capitol, or city council chambers, and their staffs will help them prepare incisive questions that show that they are paying close attention to the problem. In the second system of accountability, various parts of the administrative state, the agency itself, the inspector general, the government accountability office, will hold these same public servants accountable to process. Procurement and planning documents will be reviewed for any gaps, any skipped or partially skipped steps, any deviance from standard protocol, even if that deviance is legal, just non-standard. If an ESB is thought to be best practice, even if it is not at all best practice, why wasn't it used? If anti-fraud practices had been previously established, why weren't all of them deployed? If the vendor had been hired under an OTA, and other transaction authority, why was this exception allowed and a more thorough and standard process not followed? And who signed off on all these decisions? Angry politicians will sometimes ask such questions too, but they are less familiar with the many administrative rules and requirements. They tend to focus more on the issue their constituents care about. Why isn't the thing working? The accountability trap is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. The first system is extremely uncomfortable for the public servants subjected to it. But as painful and sometimes humiliating as these hearings are, if you're a career civil servant, it is the second system of accountability that matters most to you. Legislators can't fire or officially reprimand you, no matter how bad a job they think you did. They can't make you ineligible for promotions and raises. On the other hand, violations of policy, process, and procedure, real or perceived, can do all of that, even if there is no hearing. The people under scrutiny want to avoid these repercussions for the obvious reason that being fired or demoted affects their livelihoods, but many simply want to continue doing their jobs. They believe in what they do, and they believe that they are the best shot the agency has at fulfilling its mission. They are often right. These dynamics kick into overdrive when technical issues are in question. Even the most competent tech team can hit resistance when trying to explain, for instance, 
why there should not be an ESB in the software they are building. A team could point out that it was only suggested, not required, and Matthew Weaver tried to do just that. But the reality is that the ESB became incrementally more codified as the federal enterprise architecture gave rise to the Department of Defense enterprise architecture, which gave rise to the Air Force enterprise architecture, which gave rise to some number of additional guidance documents within the Air Force, and ultimately to the request for proposals and accompanying requirements documents that were issued when the contract was awarded. Arguments about what is or isn't required happen all the time, but they are much less likely to lead to a suffocatingly risk-averse answer when the people involved in the argument understand the domain. Here, aside from the tech team, it is highly unlikely that anyone else in the debate, likely to be dozens of people in dozens of different roles, had any basis on which to judge whether an ESB was a good thing or a bad thing in this context. Thus, to nix the ESB, dozens of people in dozens of different roles would all have had to agree to jeopardize their jobs over a recommendation they didn't understand. These discussions tend to function as a vetocracy in which it takes all thumbs up in order to accept the risk and only one thumbs down to stick with a re less risky option. The ESB stays. I'm gonna cut out a paragraph here about how this relates to cybersecurity, but if anybody would like to talk about the Federal Information Security Management Act, you can come talk to me after, or you can talk to Mike or some of the other people here. In the business world, they say that culture eats strategy for breakfast, meaning that the people implementing the strategy and the skills, attitudes, and assumptions they bring to it will make more difference than even the most brilliant plan. In government, culture eats policy. Even when legislators and policymakers try to give implementers the flexibility to exercise judgment, the words they write on excuse me, the words they write take on an entirely different meaning and have an entirely different effect as they descend through the hierarchy, becoming more rigid with each step. When rules rarely have their intended effect, more rules are not likely to improve outcomes. So I hope we'll get to talk a little bit about giving implementers the flexibility to exercise judgment, but thank you for indulging me in that. Thank you, Jen. Now, when I heard that Jen had finally written the book that I wanted her to write, uh, I immediately wanted to hear her in conversation with another dear friend, Matt Lira. Matt, I have known also for many years, you're noticing a theme here, uh, and that is because he's a longtime congressional leadership staffer. He worked for uh, a leader Cantor, Leader McCarthy. He was instrumental in helping to open up legislative data, bring new technology into Congress, working across the aisle with Steve Dwyer to hold hackathons and make Congress think differently about technology. And then he went to the other side, the executive branch, uh, and became a senior advisor uh, in the Trump administration, in the Office of American Innovation. Matt and I t claim to be members of the Get Stuff Done Caucus. We don't usually say stuff when we <laughs> mention that caucus. But he is someone who understands and respects deeply the institutions of our government and also knows how to take down barriers when they get in the way through relationships and understanding how the system works. He and Jen share a perspective of sitting in the White House, trying to get stuff done, uh, and working with the great people in the, the executive branch to make that happen. So Matt, I'm so excited for you to come up and chat about how we modernize government. Thank you so much. Uh, well, Jen, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, or Marcy, thank you for the kind introduction. I've actually, I've spoken, I was reflecting with some people as we were prepping. Uh, I've you know, had the privilege to speak at some pretty great venues. Yeah. 
uh, with some pretty great people, but this one is uniquely special. It's actually somewhat intimidating in all the right ways. Um, it says something about democracy, I guess. Um, so Nice to be here with you, yeah, Matt. Likewise. So uh, I've had the opportunity now to read the book twice. <laughs> Uh, once uh, uh, when you, you know, sent out a, a reader and once preparing for this panel, it's, it's, it gets better each time. So buy as many copies as you can and send it around. Um, but you have this really unique perspective because um, you've operated uh, you know, in the Silicon Valley community and you've seen what leading edge technology is capable of doing. And you've operated, and I, th and you, I think are fairly unique in this aspect, to have been at the vanguard of implementing policy at the city council level, at the state level, and in the walls of the White House. And one of the things I was struck by as we went through the book was the stories you were able to share about specific examples, some of which went well, and some of which uh, were lessons were learned. Yeah. Um, and it'd be great if you could share, I was struck by in particular first with a story by Yadira. Um, and maybe you could share that story with the audience today and kind of draw out some of the lessons from the book, because I think it's a great example of the kinds of insights that you, you generate in the text. Um, yeah, thanks. You, uh, it, I just want to reflect on how lovely it is to have known you for so long and get to be here in this beautiful place with you. Um, Yadira Sanchez is somebody that I did not know, a new friend. Um, that I met in doing research for the book. I thought I was gonna write a book about just the stuff that I knew already and actually ended up talking to about 100 people about their stories. And when I talked with several people I knew, they all said, you should talk to Yadira. And her story goes a little like this. Um, she came to Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, um, about 25 years ago. It was her first job. She was her, she has been in that job her whole career, or not that job, but at CMS. Um, and she's really a fantastic leader. I don't think that anybody else gets credit for how fantastic she is. Um, always wanted in IT to really be talking to the users, not just doing, like, in her lanes or the silos. She always was breaking the silos. But she also happened to be there when healthcare.gov had its troubles. Can we call them the troubles? We can. Um, and she was one of the people, uh, the civil servants that were thrown the task of fixing the site. I know many people believe that my boss, Todd Park, um, fixed the site. I think he had a very critical role in it, but there were many, many longtime public servants at CMS that helped fix the site, and Yadira was one of them. And she told me later, I'd never heard the word agile until these people came in. I did not know what that is. I know that she knew about it in the sense that she was already doing it, but she didn't have the language for it. It's not just agile, but user-centered development and a lot of the things that we talk about. And um, through that, she wanted to, she, she really was sort of a master then of agile development and user-centered development as she took on her next challenge. So after healthcare.gov, uh, Congress passes another law called MACRA. I'm not even gonna bother with the <laughs> acronym for it. And her team is responsible for implementing it. And she we're, says, we're gonna do a better job on this. Uh, and immediately, she's aware that if they don't deliver something that is much more usable for the doctors in the Medicare program, this law that's intended to improve the care that Medicare provides is going to degrade the care because doctors are so frustrated with how they're asked to provide their data, how they're asked to do their billing, et cetera, that they're, they're, they're very angry with the um, systems that they have today, and the only thing they hate more is the idea that they're gonna have to learn a whole nother one that they're also gonna hate. Um, and she says, we've gotta give them something that they're really gonna like to use. Immediately she starts hitting barriers. Um, things like, oh, the first question we need to ask them is are they a sole practitioner in a group? Guess what, there are nine different definitions of a group. Well, that's, gonna make, <laughs> that's gonna make things pretty complicated. Um, she finds out, for instance, that um, though doctors that take very few Medicare patients are exempted by the law, 
the regulators at CMS have decided that those people will have to go through the program the whole first year, learn the new software, invest in, in training, and then they'll be told that they're exempt, which is driving them insane. And it's a whole bunch of other examples, but essentially, instead of just doing what she's told, she pushes back and she says, no, we can't do that. I know I'm a tech person, I know I'm in IT, but I'm gonna have a dialogue with you folks in policy because you don't realize the impact of these things that you're saying on the usability of the systems that the doctors have to interact with. And you know, in the end, this team that continues to take charge of what they're being asked to do ships something that's on time, under budget, and so delightful for the doctors that instead of flooding the call center on the launch day with complaints, they flood the call center with like confusion because how could systems from CMS be this good? <laughs> uh, later on, you know, the, the next thing that she gets is uh, a request to do um, basically data extracts that have to do with pharmaceutical data. The law says you will do these quarterly extracts, and she says that's a terrible idea. That's going to take nine months, and it's going to be very costly. And a lot of staff are going to have to do this all the time. We could just write an API. She gets people together. She talks about that. They all agree, and she writes an API. And people go, she's not complying with the letter of the law. And what I say is she is doing what Congress asked her to do better, faster, and cheaper. And she has the courage to do it. And, and she has really been, to me, one of the most, the biggest inspirations for the book. Yeah, that's one of the things I loved about the book was, I mean, there are examples, which maybe we can get to one in a moment, of people who've made different choices. Yep. Um, who maybe, you know, would argue took the, uh, the wrong path or prioritized process over people. But there are plenty of examples where you highlight folks, both career civil servants, Yadira, uh, and, and technologists that have been able to come into government and make the choice uh, to make change. And, you know, through, I know you've had the opportunity to see that throughout the country, and, you know, I've seen that as well. Um, it's always inspirational and a privilege when you see the impact that people can make when they choose to make that impact. Um, and I saw that, you know, on the Hill, uh, Marcy mentioned some of the, of the work that we did, and Steve's here and others. Uh, and I saw it obviously in the executive branch and, and some of the folks that are here in this room, I mean, I see Eddie and others and the team and you know, making the choice to say, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> this couldn't possibly be what was intended. And sometimes you find out it was and you're like, okay, let's go change the law. <laughs> and sometimes you find out, no, it wasn't. And we can actually, we can fix it before it's a failure. Um, and highlighting those stories, it doesn't happen enough, I think. Um, we all know the story of healthcare.gov and fixing a problem in crisis, and we need that capability. But one of the lessons that I drew from the book was fixing it before it's a crisis. Um, yeah, and I think highlighting what works. I mean, we have this entire apparatus of oversight that focuses exclusively on what goes wrong. Nobody ever has talked about Yadira and what she's done well, so there's no model. We're not spending the energy lifting her up and saying, it's okay to interpret what you were told in a way that's gonna make it work, right? I'm gonna do this API instead of this data extract. So you have, you, you, we are actually all part of creating that culture of fear that says, no, I can't, I can't do it that way because I'm reading the words and I'm interpreting them very literally, <laughs> uh, which happens all the time. Um, or as you indicated with Klinger Cohen, an interpretation yeah. on a law that became a habit, that became a practice, that became a rule, that became, you know, the way it is. And there, I've had countless examples, as, as I know you have, where you poke at that a little bit. You know? yeah. And they say, well, one of the benefits of going to the executive branch from the Hill is you have some hubris about the ability to make change on the Hill. Because <laughs> yeah. I think for people who don't have that experience, you can be like, oh, you know, it's, it's a, it can be an a, a intimidating place. And so you, when, when they say, well, we have to do it because it's the law, you're like, well, show me the law. You're the one of the people who taught me this, yeah. and Marcy too. I mean, and, and when you come in, first come into government, you have no idea. People say you can't do it that way, it, it's illegal. Um, you know, great example is, um, the, do people here know the fantastic project uh, between OPM, GSA, and USDS called SMEQA, Subject Matter Expert Qualifying Assessments? 
you know, they look at this and they go, the hiring process is crazy. It results in lists of people who are not qualified in any manner for the job that we're trying to hire for. And HR people say, sorry, that's the only legal way to do it. But if you actually go back and look at the law, it says, and I'm skipping over some steps here, but that veterans' preference is applied after a qualifying assessment. That's not what they're doing. So in, in a certain sense, you know, and it's not to, it's not to denigrate the HR people who are trying to do their jobs, trying to comply with the law, trying to do the right thing, but what the process that they have been told is the only legal way to do it isn't actually the legal way to do it at all. And you have to sort of recompile the process in order to get the right outcome. And I find when you challenge that with, I don't know the ratio, but I'm gonna be generous, say nine times out of 10, <laughs> The, whether it's the HR professional or the counsel or whoever, the career civil servant who's mission driven, they signed up to work for government for a reason. Um, and once you can show and demonstrate that there's a better path, they, you know, I won't say nine out of 10, but many of the times they'll get really excited. Yes. And we saw this on the Hill. I mean, Steve and I were having the darndest time trying to get support for alleged data, um, including from the library in all candor. Um, I'm former, so I can say whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once we showed them the impact, the library and the team here has been the consistent biggest champion for that change for over a decade. So once they knew that it wasn't just an exercise for, in, you know, because of some you know, trend, they saw that. Yeah, you unleash their power to do what they yeah. came here to do. So for, for the one out of ten. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know you have a story in the book, which I, I want to share only because I think there's a lot of change makers in this room. Just looking around, I see people from the Hill, I see people from, uh, you know, with, from USDS and other organizations. What, how do you handle the situations when that light bulb doesn't turn on? And what lessons did you draw from that in the book? Um, so I tell the story of, this, this is sort of my own story, um, when I was working uh, in the White House and was doing a sort of what we call discovery sprint with the veterans, sorry, the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, on the Veterans Benefit Management System, which was really, really slow. So I'd recruited a couple people to come do a couple weeks to help understand what we could do to make it faster. Of course, you can understand what the problems are when the system to manage the claims <laughs> Uh, it has latency of over two minutes, right? So you, you'd click on this thing, you could go make a cup of coffee, come back, and the page would load. You're obviously not gonna be processing a lot of veterans' claims with a system like that. Um, first of all, the guy that we meet with, um, who's a senior leader, um, VA leader, says, I'm so glad you're here because um, it's great that the White House sent some people to verify that it's all better now. And we find out later that it's all better because he defined latency as anything under two minutes. So if you clicked and it took one minute and 59 seconds to load the page, you were not to report a problem. And when you have fewer reports of problems, it seems like everything's good. Um, but in that first day, talking with this technology leader, I kept asking him questions about why the the VBMS was built that way, why had they made this choice or why they had made that choice. And he kept saying, it's not my call, I don't know, you'll have to ask the program people, you'll have to ask the business people. And I said, why? And he said, I have spent my career uh, trying to teach my people not to have an opinion on the business requirements. If they ask us to build a concrete boat, we'll build a concrete boat. And I said, why? And he said, what? because that way, it's not our fault. And it was a dark day for me. I was hurt, I think, by it because, and just really demoralized. It was one of those days where I wanted to just go home because at the time, I think there were 18 veterans committing suicide a day, many of them waiting for their benefits and their claims to be processed, and it just seemed like such an abdication of responsibility um, but I also do understand what he was saying about the way we set up systems that really are about sort of nobody being in, in charge, nobody really having the responsibility for it. And I, I want to blame the system, not the person. Um, but I'm glad I recovered from that day of demoralization um, from many people in the room helped me get over that. But I, I think that's the thing. I think if, you know, since this is a wonderful group of 
people from the Hill and, and uh, exec, uh, executive branch and administrative agencies, um, what are we doing that makes someone say, I'm not supposed to have an opinion on the business requirements? What are, how are we creating that environment? I think that's sort of what I want the book to get at. Yeah, and the challenge, um, those of us who are in this community, uh, well, one, to be aware that you're gonna face it. You just are. Yeah. And to challenge yourself not to surrender to it, I think. Um, and to keep the focus, you know, I think, again, I, to be at the risk of having a tagline like people over process, uh, you know, uh, um, checks and balances are not an excuse for bad outcomes, Yeah. you know, and thinking through. And when you face that, how do you react to, uh, to it and how do you overcome it? Um, you know, two quick things. One, I mean, Secretary Shulkin, who um, perhaps had an unceremonious end to his tenure, I still consider to be... Uh, it was a holdover from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. Um, and I was in a meeting with him once and he said, the number of veterans who die at that time every month is equivalent to like a 737 crashing. And if a 737 was crashing every month, would we care more about solving that problem or this paperwork problem? Right. And it's easy, especially in the federal government, to lose appreciation for the scale of the challenges because they seem so overwhelming. But bringing that sense of prioritization is something that I think is incumbent on any change maker, whether they be a career civil servant like Adira or yeah. technologist who's come into an organization. And speaking of paperwork, um, I really hope you read the book. There's another story about the VA that's much more positive um, that is about deciding that the paperwork is wrong and uh, that's, that's MTAV's story in the back. So. Um, it's as, they, as you said earlier, it's in the book. Just read the book. Yeah, I was like, well, you got to say it's in the book. You know, it's part of the. Uh, you know, I want to say one other thing about the thing with with, yeah. with the VA though, which is we then went for two weeks and hung out with people who were trying to work on the system, and nobody else felt that way. Yeah. Nobody else didn't want to have like they all had opinions on the business requirements. They just needed to be listened to. Yeah. You just get to break through that layer. Well, and that's that was, a great segue in terms of breaking through. And you talk about this and. I was talking with someone earlier actually about how as I've become older, I have shifted my focus from more tactical concerns to cultural concerns yeah. inside large organizations. And I've looked to and been inspired by like what I consider to be the most dynamic organizations in our society, government, academic, business, nonprofit, et cetera. And they almost all have these really dynamic cultures. And I, I don't know if you coined the phrase, uh, but we'll give it to you, I mean, culture eats policy. And uh, if you can speak to some of that, I, you know, those of us that are in this, you know, I have a thought on it, but I'll let you go first, and then I'll build, I'll build on it. <laughs> um, I don't. I think I, I, I think I've coined it for myself, and someone else may have also coined it. So I'm not going to take exclusive rights over it. But um, it was sort of what came to me as I was thinking about these issues of, you know, you write a law, and then it, it, it just has the opposite. I had never seen it before, so I think okay. it, I think we should declare. <laughs> <laughs> it's been coined. I, I, I am making stickers at some point, and one of them will say um, culture eats policy. But, but I think the point, the, the point I think of identifying that, as you say, is that um, after you look at things like Claire Cohen tries to make technology better in government, and in some ways it does, and in some times it, wakes it makes it worse, right? In some ways you end up with this ESB that will, you know, doom the software. Um, we have a lot of law governing how we hire and promote that is intended to um, have a mer merit system for hiring and promotion, and it just sometimes has the opposite effect. So culture, if, if culture is eating the policy and your job is to make policy or make law, what do you do about that? And I think my basic answer is aim your three big levers, money, rules, and oversight, at the culture, which basically means aim it at building the best pub civil service that we have. It's people. Uh, I mean, the line culture uh, eats policy is basically saying it's the people who matter, it's their incentives, um, it's how they feel about their jobs, it's who's blocking them. And I do think, and we're not going to get into it in depth here, but there is a lot that people on yeah this side of D.C. could be doing with those levers that could make our the culture of the civil service better. Because it's there's not it's 
really not that much wrong with the, right? The people are amazing. Yeah. Sure, there's a couple people like Kevin, I get it, but like we have amazing people who want to do amazing work, yeah. and if we can get them set up to do that and unleash them, we're, so many of these problems are going to get so much better, but we're kind of right now thinking about things extractively, like how can I get my policy done and my policy outcome? But like if your policy outcome is trying to happen in a world of very low state capacity and a civil service that just can't is so blocked in so many ways, then stop worrying about your policy for a minute and worry about the thing that will enable all the policies. That's a really um, salient point. I think it was uh, you know, David Axelrod in a podcast uh, that he does up in Chicago talked about um, if you want people to have faith in government, you need to have a government worth having faith in. And he's obviously Absolutely. progressive. This wasn't, yeah. you know, this isn't a conservative talking point. He was just saying we need to give, if, we need government to work better, and then we can argue over, you know, it should it do more or less. But what it does, it should do well. Um, yeah. And that's how we ultimately restore faith in our governing institutions and in our politics. Uh, it, it's less about the, like, which kind of ads are being run, and it's more about the experiences that people are having every single day. And if those are positive experiences, they will believe in this country. And if they're negative experiences, they will question this country. That's right. Um, so, and you and I have talked about this yeah. for years. Um, I, Matt is the person I talked to, I think, the day after Trump won the presidency in the peeps. Um, made me feel much better about what was going on, having served the prior president. Um, but you know, one of the things that we see is that when people have bad experiences with government services, particularly means-tested benefits, but things that are frustrating, they vote at lower rates. And that's the connection, I, th I mean, there's a bu there was some great stats on that today in a uh, presentation I was in, but there's so much evidence that we are driving people away from politics and government and civic engagement by having poor government services, and we just need to connect those dots a if lot better. If it's just a sport, if it's just if it's a placeholder for like you know the NFL or the NBA and it's fun to play on one team or the other, then it's only going to attract people who are interested in the spectacle. If it's substantive, if it's about people's lives, uh, then it's going to attract people who want to be players on the field. Uh, if you give the analogy, and I think that like that is what we have an obligation to. And what's been inspiring to me, honestly, because you know, you go into any administration. Maybe mine had this uh, with a slightly different ratio. You're going to have days that are challenging. <laughs> I think you had a couple. Of days. Uh, I had a couple. <laughs> um, but what always would recharge me is the outcomes. Yeah. Uh, the outcomes and the impact, and uh, and that endures. I think, and so I can't think of anything more noble or purposeful than being a part of than that. And so, for those of you that are in this room, and you're, you know, particularly those of you that are from the Hill community. Um, there's an endless amount of policies that need to change. Um, I, we've talked about this before, but um, when I was started in the White House, I walked over to the Lincoln Memorial and I saw the words, the unfinished work carved in stone. Mm. And I thought, like, how American and how appropriate is that? That the word unfinished is carved in stone. It will forever be unfinished. So my goal as I went into that challenge, should not be to finish every problem, but it should be to do what I can while I can with what, what, we, what we can achieve. And that's the spirit I built on with the work you were doing and Todd and many others. Um, but as you, th again, thinking about the Hill, I would I almost challenge you in a way, if I could be so bold, to think not just about a singular piece of legislation, but about this cultural yeah. argument and finding people in the government who are doing the right thing the right way, maybe not perfectly, and being a champion of what they're doing. Because sometimes they feel alone, sometimes they feel unheard. And right now, the people in the middle, the story you shared about the gentleman at the VA, they're just trying to avoid being hit. Yeah. And we have a chance to lift them up, to celebrate their work, and to create more people like that uh, in, the, in the civil service. I think all of this work gets done because people support each other and recognize the good in each other and recognize the passion for public service in each other and get them through the hard days. And uh, 
I'd love to see, I, I feel like I know very well a large community of people who do that in administrative agencies, and I know there's that community on the Hill, and I would love to see those groups hang out more and talk more and help each other through days. I think Bess Dobkin came in, yeah, there she is. So she would like explain, try to explain things from the DOD over to the people on the Hill, and just like, just tirelessly, tirelessly trying to explain between these agencies, uh, between DOD and the Hill. You're amazing, Bess, she's, she's awesome. Um, and like, we just need more of that. We just don't have that many people who are bilingual. <laughs> Uh, well, and building on that, maybe in a slightly different way, something I wanted to touch on was just uh, bipartisanship, or even yeah. postpartisanship in some ways. Um, you know, you and I have had collaborations over, you know, many years. Uh, other people in this room have been able to do the same thing, and I think it's important that people see that not as an act. It's often characterized as a profile in courage, mm -hmm. sort of as a sacrificial act, um, and there are moments where that's called for. But I think if, you know, hopefully what we can impart today is it, it can also be a, a profile in progress, a profile in success. It doesn't have to be something that's, you know, that damages someone's career or their goals um, or their values. I mean, you have never once, I think, in all of our conversations or, or work together, compromised or imputed your progressive values. And I would like to think that I've never Thank done you. the same for my conservative values in all candor but yet we've been able to find those areas where we agree and get some stuff done. So, uh, you know, you reflect on this in the book, but even beyond, like, uh, what, what, what do you draw from that as you think about the broader political climate we're in and legislative culture? I think the vision of left and right in our country right now is not a super helpful one. <laughs> um, I just have my own lived experience of finding such common ground with you and many others. Um, um, and I do think it derives from the same desire to serve the public, um, no matter how it may be characterized at times. I think it's important also to understand that there is a divide now that does not that much to do with left and right, which is a divide between people who want to build state capacity and people who want to dismantle it. A lot of people on the right actually want to build it and I talk to them a lot, you're one, others. It's, and it just, that doesn't mean like build a big intrusive government. It, what I'm talking about is the capacity to serve people in not burdensome ways, in efficient ways, uh, in ways that make them wanna vote, right? Um, and so, and a lot of people on the left, I think, remain skeptical about building state capacity for a bunch of reasons. So we do have this, I think, common cause but I also always want to recognize that I think the, those who are very set on dismantling state capacity, um, you know, let's get rid of the deep state, are acting from a place of frustration. They may have other motivations too, but I can see their frustration in status quoism, uh, in this is the way it's always been done-ism, and I can see that in myself. I have been frustrated with that too. Um, I think the difference between sort of the agenda right now of dismantle state capacity and my view is there's a lot of people focused on let's being able to fire people in government better. Maybe that needs to happen at some point. I really think it's important right now that we be able to hire people in government. Let's do that first. <laughs> uh, and then we can talk about the other stuff. But it, it, you know, I, I don't want to totally otherize the people who have this agenda that's, you know, I would say on the other side of mine because I can see where they are coming from. It is easy to get very frustrated and want to blow it all up. I just think we gotta take that frustration, put it somewhere else and figure out how to build Obviously, building is gonna involve dismantling some stuff that existed, like why is this policy this way? Why is this process this way? But it's ultimately in the service of building something better. Yeah, I think that's, that, well, that's all uh, on point, and particularly the point about understanding people's, like empathizing with the perspective of someone you don't naturally agree with. Mm -hmm. like, why do you think X? And you might find out, well, 
I think X because we sh have a shared grievance, even if we disagree on the next step. And that, one, it shows a level of respect for the American people that I think is really important if you're working in government in particular. Like, very few Americans are irrational. They might be wrong, <laughs> but they're not irrational. There's a reason why an American thinks something about something. And putting more effort into understanding why that is would serve us all well. And then I think, too, at a very fundamental level, that the country has a choice between redemption or retribution. I mean, if you continue to play a game where, well, one side did something to the other side and we're gonna go back and forth, you know, like a, a tennis match from hell, <laughs> uh, or we can say, well, how do we redeem the idea of this country and bring, build a greater understanding. And the reason I have faith that that's even possible is one, I look at the work that's happening in a lot of state and local government, and I see that it's achievable, and even at the federal government, um, you, know, you just see it happening. Mm -hmm. And if it can happen once, it can happen a million times. Um, and so to the, you know, the folks that are here from the policy community, like don't fall into the trap that it has to be um, a zero-sum game, or that it has to be antagonistic to the point of dysfunction. Now, I'll be honest, like, anyone who knows my bio uh, and, and your bio, like, when we have a political disagreement, like, we bring it. <laughs> uh, and we'll debate and we'll fight and we'll try to win campaigns, whatnot. But, like, there's a, there's a season for working together and getting stuff done. And um, I think I made a very concerted choice earlier in my career to be a part of that. And many of you in this room I know have done the same, and it's the right choice. Can so I bring up it. another divide that you crossed Please. well? Please, yeah. Um, I, I talk about this in the book, and it might be a little controversial. There's a divide between policymakers and implementers. Yeah. And um, when you talk about trying to really understand someone's point of view, you know who does that really well? User researchers. Yeah. And they challenge their own assumptions because they go and try to really see the person trying to get the service or whatever, and instead of telling them what they should want, they try to deeply understand their needs. And that's a skill, I think, that can cross into the policymaking world. In fact, I think it has, and there's some examples in the book of the ways policymakers have adopted that technique and that discipline to do their jobs better. Um, they're now inviting implementers to the table when policy and even law is being written. It's a crazy idea to talk to someone actually doing the thing when you design rules for that thing. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. It works. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I do think that that's another divide that we need to bridge is... Um, do you have any advice uh, for, for folks based on your experience and the research for the book? I'm bridging those connections. I mean, it's like reach out. <laughs> like, <laughs> reach out to people. I mean, on both sides, um, I think, um, I mean, I've, I've seen hesitance to, from both sides, right? So um, I talk in the book about a project at Code for America called C Clear My Record, where I'll, I'll sort of skip to the end, but we, we sort of found that if you didn't have technologists at the table when records clearance laws were being written, they would write laws that were essentially unimplementable. I mean, unimplementable if you wanted to expunge records automatically. If you don't do it automatically, then basically no one will get the expungement, so why bother writing the law? Yeah. But they, you know, in the end, like you have to have somebody there that you would never have had in the room before when you were writing that law. And, and so I'd say, yes, just reach out from the policymaker side from, or you know, even lawmakers. But I also, in researching the book, and this part's not in here for various reasons, but heard about a lot of hesitation from people on the implementation side going, wait a minute, you want me to go deal with something that hasn't even passed the house yet? Like, why would I do that? I'm very, very busy. Well, why are you so busy? Because you get handed stuff that's not implementable and takes 10 years to like deal with. Whereas if you would just go and be in the meeting and be like, hey guys, if you just write it this way, we can like suck up that data in 10 minutes and boom, we're done, right? Like, I'm slightly over That's actually what it, I think it is the, my, my favorite story in, in the entire book. Is it? Is that, because there's a line and I, I wish I was good enough to have memorized it, but. I probably have it. It's to the effect. <laughs> of, you know, is there a higher loyalty to uh, 
you know, do you think anyone that was critica criticizing their challenging that question on the front end cared when it actually worked on the back end? Right, yes. Like when it actually helped millions of people in the real world and their lives were actually improved, do you think anyone at that point cared that there was one or two or dozen uncomfortable meetings where tough questions were asked? Um, and depending on where you are in the process, I think it's really important, um, you know, particularly if you're in, on the Hill or uh, in, in the White House, to think about finding and championing and defending and empowering the people who are delivering that change. Because sometimes those will be the same people you hear the most criticism about because they ask the tough question in a meeting. And I would say that that is far worse, uh, or excuse me, it's far better to change the outcome for the millions of people, as you talked about in that story, than it is to have a, you know, a meeting without tough questions. So uh, I, was really, I was inspired by it. It had a lot of sticky notes on that page in my copy of the book. Um, well, thank you so much for thank you. Here, this here. chat. And, and now we have a few minutes for audience questions. Definitely relevant to the question. Thank you both so much. I'm coming from the legislative side of things. Um, I'm really moved by the idea that we should be addressing culture as opposed to, or before policy. Um, but in my short time on the ledge side of things, um, it's clear how easy it is to figure out the mechanics of, you know, developing a policy, trying to enact it, trying to move it forward, trying to get it in the news. Um, whereas it's more nebulous, like what the process is to, or the mechanics of actually enacting that culture change. And, you know, I get the idea of reaching out, but we face so many different time constraints and political constraints. And so I'm wondering um, the perspective you might have on how uh, you went through that in your careers. Would it be crazy for me to read another short passage? Not crazy. Ew. This was the one, this was the, uh, thank you so much for that question. I, I hope this addresses it a little bit. Um, but uh, th this speaks to policy and um, delivery teams working together. Um, I think there's also sort of a political aspect to your question too, but I wanna start with this and then hand it to, to Matt, if that's okay. Um, so I basically, basically say, you know, the, um, the lesson of this Clear My Record program was that we've gotta get, you know, technologists at the policy. It's not just technologists, like people who do user research, really. So um, it's just a matter of, find, of inviting different voices into the conversation and finding a common language with them. That common language is neither tech speak nor legalese. It focuses on people, understanding their needs and testing our assumptions about them. Tom Loosemore, one of the founding members of the Government Digital Service in the UK, worked with a policymaker who'd co compiled mountains of academic research and analysis in advance of a revision of a major social policy. He was sure he knew to an incredible level of detail what this new policy should do and how it should work when Tom started working with him. Tom's work didn't start with academic analysis. It started with user research, talking to real people who would use the service and be affected by the new policy, and understanding their circumstances, their resources, and most of all, their needs. This approach was very different and eye-opening for Tom's policy partner. A few weeks into working with the GDS team, he came to Tom with his inches thick binder of documents and plopped it down on the table. You know, he said, I've come to the realization that what I'm holding is really 600 pages of untested assumptions. I'm gonna just set it aside for a little while. Uh, and Tom has now seen this many times. Why, he asks, is so much policy educated guesswork with a feedback loop measured in years. It doesn't have to be. Maybe you can take it from there, Matt. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I would think avoid falling into the trap of just mimicking the behavior that, uh, that you see. Um, I mean, there's obviously gonna be lessons to draw from you know, experience and whatnot, but the, the um, it's so easy to sort of fall into the a habit that just accepts a status quo if it's sort of failing, but in a consistent way. So, you know, challenge yourself, challenge your colleagues, to try something different, um, and start with what you can as a beachhead, but presuming if it works, it'll continue to build and build and build and eventually enact the kind of change that you seek. A culture change is really about people at the end of the day. 
So building you know, networks of the right people and empowering the right people will ultimately lead to the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. But in terms of how to actually effectuate that, particularly from the Hill, um, you know, I can think of examples in my own career where I started as, with something as simple as like a single event with Steve Dwyer, who I think is in here somewhere, um, who worked for Mr. Hoyer, and I worked for Mr. Canner at the time, so it was a little, you know, obviously bipartisan. And it worked, and we did it again, and it grew and became, and it led to other things. So um, if you put a signal flare into the world, you'd be surprised who kind of rallies. Um, and when someone tells you that it can't be done that way, they're probably wrong. Here, here. Other question, here. Hi, uh, my name is Saketh. Uh, I'm an intern on Capitol Hill right now. <laughs> um, so my question deals with uh, people who aren't as receptive to that culture change uh, that you talked about, especially uh, in my brief time on the Hill. Uh, I've worked under and alongside people who might be a bit older or more resistant to uh, bringing technology and, and change into the office or, or on Capitol Hill and policy in general. So how would you navigate people who are either against it or resistant to that type of change? I guess the first thing I would say is if you can actually learn why, you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot about um, the history of the problem. It's probably been tried to, it, someone probably tried to fix it before and it was a disaster and now that's really, they don't want to engage because they don't want that to happen again. Um, you may not necessarily change their mind, but your thinking will be stronger. Um, the basic characteristic and competency of user research is empathy. And if we don't use that inside the bureaucracy as well as we use it with users, we're not doing our jobs. I, I mean, I, I'm speaking from a user research perspective, I realize you're on the Hill. But um, you can find out a lot by talking to people who are resistant, and it's usually really, really revealing. Hi, I'm Michelle. I work for um, actually, I work for Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan, and the reason I'm saying that is uh, for anyone who is here. Hi, Nicole, uh, one of my colleagues who um, is interested in this sort of thing. There's not really a good vehicle, I don't think, for people on the Hill to come together and work on this stuff. So if you're here tonight and you care about this, come find me. We can coordinate and we can all work together. Um, I, a couple of things you said earlier. Um, generated a couple of ideas. One, you know, we used to do technical corrections, so maybe if there's an ESB somewhere today, maybe we can start doing technical technical corrections to enable that kind of culture change in the agencies. Maybe we can uh, encourage our bosses to do hearings on what's working in the agencies, which they're not doing now. Um, and ideally, we can all maybe meet with somebody as we're writing a bill who um, who's going to implement it. We can figure out how to do that. Um, as in addition to someone who is um, going, supposed to benefit. I wondered if you had other kind of like tactical, specific things that maybe we could take back and implement in our offices. I think those are great ideas. Um, yay. Um, and build, build a community, I think you're saying, like build a community of people who are doing it. Um, um, I think there's a lot to be done on civil service. Um, and I don't know that entire agenda. I've actually for a while I've been looking for funding for someone to, to do a paper on what are all the little um, barriers and bottlenecks in hiring. Um, and probably 10% uh, of those things are gonna require actual congressional action, um, but a lot of them will require support, right? Um, is OPM feel, does OPM feel like this is the thing they're supposed to be doing, right? Um, Smequa, which I mentioned earlier, is a fantastic project. Hey, Will, you can talk to Will. Um, <laughs> it, should it should be scaled really, really widely. Why isn't it? Talk to Will, he'll tell you why. <laughs> and then just one by one, break down those barriers. I mean, I think the thing is there is no silver bullet, but there are all these little things that you find. We're like, oh my God, that is adding X months to the process. It's completely unnecessary. <laughs> Why? Um, uh, so yeah, definitely focus um, on the civil service. I, I mean, I, I think that you really, whenever you see a problem where, I mean, I saw this at the DOD a ton, right? That the, um, the, the Congress would say, well, we gave you all these authorities. Why aren't you using them? 
right? Or hiring authorities, um, procurement authorities. Uh, and the people say, well, you know, we can't for, the, for these various reasons. You're going to have to unpack that in, and you can't unpack that in an environment of fear. You have to build trust. Yeah, Excellent. Love everything you just said. In fact, when we were trying to do some reforms on personnel stuff at the Pentagon in 2019, the Senate pretty much stopped it because they're like, look, we've, we've given them authorities for five years and they haven't implemented. In terms of tactically tying it back to a member office, the one hack that I think is underutilized is tying it back to a legislative win that the member or the committee was a part of previously. So if you want to have a hearing on, particularly if there's not political alignment between the administration and the particular committee, you know, saying, well, you know, this is a shared win because you're dealing with like implementation of the X Act, and let's bring in uh, agencies that have done something good on that. Will Hurd, when he was uh, chairman, um, used to do two to one rule. So he'd have two agencies that he had questions about or was critical of, and he'd have one witness who he was there to essentially celebrate. And I always thought that was a great model. One more question to finish this up. Uh, hi, my name's Zach. I'm also an intern up here on the Hill. Uh, I'm one, this question is more for the people who aren't decision makers, who aren't in a position to make change. Uh, what can people on the bottom of the ladder do to uh, start our careers in a way that uh, can help make these reforms, right? Is, do we have to wait until our generation is up there or what can we do from the bottom? I, I don't have an answer for that, you gotta go. Yeah, <laughs> that's well, a great question. <laughs> I have some thoughts. So first of all, uh, you're not in charge yet. I mean, you undoubtedly will be, and probably faster than you think. <laughs> so whether it's in, on the Hill or in the executive branch or in business or you know, at a university. So just preparing yourself to be ready for that moment. But second, like the amazing thing about Capitol Hill in particular is the sense of empowerment that you have just by being through the door. Um, I remember the feeling of approaching Capitol Hill before I worked here, and it felt like approaching a castle I was like, how do I even get into that place? Um, and then you get in, you're like, wow, this is pretty, pretty fun. And so you'd be surprised with what you can achieve now before you, you know, get all the way to the, um, to, you know, to whether chief of staff member, uh, you know, speaker, <laughs> um, anything's possible. I mean, Kevin McCarthy was at one time an entry level staffer, and now he's speaker of the house, so anything's possible. Um, but you're obviously not in a position to authorize things that are radically changing the way that the system is going, but preparing yourself to do that and being ready for the moments when those opportunities will present themselves. Um, in fact, the gentleman right behind you has done that in spades over in the executive branch, but um, the, those moments will, will approach faster than, than, you will, than you'll expect. And I have found, for what it's worth, that one of the distinguishing characteristics between people that have really made a go of Capitol Hill, and it's totally fine if the journey takes you elsewhere, and those that haven't, is the willingness to say yes when those windows of opportunity are there. Yeah. And because that becomes a success, which becomes a promotion, which becomes more. So um, you may not be able to solve every problem today, but you'd be surprised how fast you can be a part of solving them. Since Matt just assured you that you'll be in charge in a couple years, and I, I said speaker, that, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say something that's not an answer to your question, which is you have the ability now to do things like um, go to the social services offices, or go hang out at the Veterans Administration, or go hang out with Will Slack at OPM, and just like see stuff from the bottom up. Take that now and swear to yourself right now that 10 years from now when you're in charge, you will still do that. Hear, hear. And I am gonna take a point of personal privilege and point to Ann Meeker and say also, pay attention to congressional casework because that's where you find out where the problems are. Everyone, please give an incredibly big round of applause for Jen Polka and Matt Lira. Thank you both so much. We are all going to rise up to the next level here and, and enjoy a reception. Jen is going to be signing books, uh, and there are so many good people to talk to here, so please just mingle, enjoy, and talk about modernizing government. Thank you all so much. <laughs>